What's going on guys? Cheers to you. It's Friday night. We're talking pre-FOC, but we're in two places at once because we're right here on the screen and we're at Baltimore Comic Con. What's going on guys and welcome to the last call show where we are talking books that are hitting final order cutoff this coming Monday night at 10 p.m. We aren't going to talk about all the books. We can, as always will give our 10 picks that we like. If you want to see that full list you can go to simplemanscomics.com. I have the full list up over there. But let me introduce my co-host Jack Tomeo aka Mr. Bolo. What's going on Simplemans Comics family? We talk about this every week. This is my favorite show of the week, not only because we get to sit back and drink these adult Kool-Aids, but we get to take a look ahead at the FOC list, that final order cutoff list, and take a look at some books that hit the spectrum of comic book collecting. We're talking about collector books. We're talking about great reads, and we're talking about those possible future spec plays and giving you, the viewer, the opportunity to get in on this early save a little bit of money, lock in your copies with your LCS, and do your LCS a favor and let them be able to predict the demand for upcoming releases. Right. So as I said at the beginning of this show, we are going to talk about 10 books that we like. But before we get into that, do us a favor and smash that like button for us. And if this is your first time on this channel, please consider subscribing. And the first book we're going to talk about in tonight's show actually is from a publisher that doesn't participate in FOC with Diamond, but it is an important book that we think you should be aware of. And we're talking about RV9 number one, which comes from Mad Cave Studios. Absolutely. And I think, Brian, again, this is the beauty of this show. This is a, a publisher, you say, that doesn't participate, but really doesn't get to participate. Most publishers want to be a part of FOC. They want to be alerting retailers of when those order cutoff dates are, because even publishers that are not participating in FOC, they basically still have the same order windows as ones that are. And really, FOC is just an alerting system to let LCS is know that this is the time to order. Mad Cave Studios not participating is part of the reason why those Mad Cave print runs are so low. This book, RV9, is a book that has some buzz behind it. But this is the type of book that comes out, does well, and then the next thing you know, you cannot find it at your LCS. So that's the beauty of this show. If you're not familiar with this book, the solicitation goes a little bit like this, that former assassin Velveteen is on the run from the Order of the Nine. The organization that took her from her family and forced her into a life where all she knows is secrecy, violence, and death. Now, after years of running, she is bringing the fight to them with the help from her American hacker, uh, from an American hacker, Jasper, a rookie officer with an attitude inspector, Posse. Velveteen will use everything she has been taught by the Order of the Nine against them. This sounds awesome, kind of a Blade Runner, kind of futuristic feel to it. Uh, Female-driven, and we know what some of those female covers have been able to do. Uh, Mad Cave Studios, one thing I like about them is they bring a little bit of everything to the table. They've got kind of a, a book for every reader, um, but their print runs tend to be extremely, extremely micro print runs. I'm talking about 2,000 copies or less. That does not leave a lot on the market. This, this is the reason for this show is we can highlight great books like this uh, from a great publisher who we feel con confident you know, will deliver for readers. But if you don't let your LCS know right now that you want this book, you may get left in the cold on it. Right. Big urban areas, they carry a lot of indie publishers, but some of the smaller areas, the smaller markets, that's the reason why we have these type title on this show. So if this is something you're interested in, make sure you let your local comic book store know that way they can get those ordered and secure your copies. Here we have a six issue mini series from Marvel, Punisher Soviet number one. This has got three different covers for it. There's gonna be a Paolo Rivera cover. There's also a Jason Burroughs as well as an artist variant that Jason Burroughs, important to remember that is looking to be a 1 in 25 incentive variant. Right, now you mentioned the artist, Brian, but for me the selling point of this series is the writer, Garth Ennis. 
who, of course, is the co-creator of The Boys and Preacher, but also wrote some really excellent Punisher Max. Marvel Max series. Right, and this and this book is rated Max when you look at the um, the kind of uh, adult rating system that Marvel puts out on this books, which means this thing is going to be bloody. This thing is going to be graphic. This is going to be the Punisher book that we all enjoy. So, for me, this is not necessarily a speculation play. I like that there's a 125 incentive. I think this book will be under-ordered, but... As a 90s Punisher fan, that's why I'm excited about this book. Um, a dozen Russian mobsters lay dead at the Punisher's feet, but he wasn't the one to pull the trigger. Uh, if you know Frank Castle, you know he doesn't. that doesn't necessarily set his mind at ease. Who in New York City is decimating the Russians? Um, and can it be long before they come into conflict with Frank? This is a Russian mob, Frank Castle, um, detective mystery kind of murder story. I think this is going to be a fun read. Um that's what really, to me, the appeal of this book. And I think it's going to get overlooked, so you never know. And sure, could it be um, the basis of a movie? Yeah, no doubt. I think we all know that um, John Barenthal at some point is coming to the MCU. And kind of Russian-based stories are certainly popular in the media right now. But that's not the appeal to me to this book. I want some badass Marvel Max Punisher stuff. And I think we're going to get that here with Garth Ennis. Yeah, I think this is going to be a book that if you're a Punisher fan, this is one series that you're probably going to want to read. I'm looking at you, that dude who's probably combing his beard right now, looking at his Punisher War Journal 9-9 that he dropped and cracked almost. Didn't really crack it. But either way, Punisher fans, I really see being excited about this book, and I'm one of them myself. Here we have a book that's no stranger to this channel. We've had the creators on here with an interview before. FOC of issue number one. Now the series is wrapping up with issue number six. But not for good because we got news that there's a one shot and another mini series coming up. But we're talking about Canto number six. David Boer, Drew Zucker on art. It's going to have the regular cover. But it's got a fire one in ten incentive variant in my opinion. Yeah, I totally agree. And while this series has kind of died down a bit on the secondary market prices, I think that's just a spec cycle, right? People have moved on to other things. Um, we're deep into this series. From a reader perspective, I'm very interested to see where this story ends. Um, I've been hooked the entire time. I love the incentives. To me, the fact that it's died down is good. Because, again, we know that it's coming back. We know that it did so well. There were so many late printing store exclusives produced for number one. Retailers got on board. I think the second volume is going to do well. I think the one shot is going to do well. I think they're headed towards seven seasons in a movie, Brian, at some point. Um, I think that's I think that's where this is going. And if you don't know what I'm saying, that's a reference to a David Boer quote from our interview with these guys, um, the creators of Canto, not Canto, right here on Simpleman's Comics YouTube channel. Definitely check that video out if you have not seen it. But um, Brad and I were just talking before we got on the mic that, you know, really there's just buying opportunities right now with Kanto. Um, or, see, now I did it. See, can with Kanto. Um, see what you guys do to me? Um, but, yeah, there's just buying opportunities right now because the book has dropped down. Um, and I think that this is why we do it on the pre-FOC show because now you have the opportunity to make sure you let your LCS know because this being the last issue and stores hate getting stuck with last issues and maybe like the – lack of success four and five had on the secondary market i could see lcs is fading back from those orders so do not take this one for granted do not assume you're going to be able to get it make sure you put those orders in pre-foc yeah so shout out to david boo and drew yeah so shout out to dave boo and drew zucker i also as at the beginning at the opening before the intro we mentioned we were at baltimore comic-con i want to give a shout out also baltimore comic-con and the Comic Core, if you guys haven't checked out the Comic Core on YouTube, make sure you check out their channel. Great group of people, always have a bunch of great content. And we are hanging out with them, I'm sure, right now at Baltimore. They have a booth there, so we're going to stop by and talk to them. But let's move into the next pick.
Getting back over into DC, but this is not the normal DC. This is that young animal imprint. And we're talking about Far Sector number one. This is going to have three different covers. You have that regular cover. There's a Martin Bro variant as well as a McKelvey variant. I usually like the A cover on here, but I'm a big fan of McKelvey's art. So I'll probably pick up that as well. But tell us more about this book, Jack. Well, Brian, this one's real interesting. Honestly, this is a bit of a spec play. And we say that because it appears that there's going to be a first appearance of a new Green Lantern character. Um, this is a little odd coming out of the young animal imprint, which has tended to do kind of like those out there characters from the DC Comics universe like Mother Panic and Doom Patrol. This gets a little bit more mainstream. But for the past six months, newly chosen Green Lantern Sojourner Joe Mullen – uh, has been protecting the city enduring a massive metropolis of 20 billion people. The city has maintained peace for over 500 years by stripping its citizens of their ability to feel. And as a result, violent crime is virtually unheard of and murder is non-existent. But that's all about to change in this new maxi series that gives DC Young Animal a spin to the legacy of the Green Lanterns. I think that there is going to be some speculation paid attention to this series. We know that any time in the past when DC has brought in a new Green Lantern, whether it was Baz or Jessica Cruz, we have seen heat in the secondary market for that character. Here we have a new Green Lantern. We have a story that's kind of out there and different and I think could get some reader buzz. And being on the Young Animal imprint, I could see this being a much smaller print run than a typical Green Lantern book. This is one to keep an eye out for from a speculation perspective as well as a reader buzz perspective because the solicitation in and of itself has me interested in wanting to read it. Now, I will admit I am a Green Lantern fan. I try to read everything that I can Green Lantern, so I, this is one I will definitely read. But I think an African-American, at least that's the way she comes off in the cover, uh, African-American female Green Lantern um, is one that I think will have some buzz in the market. I think it's one to pay attention to. Um, and, and like I said, there's precedent in the past for success from, from new Green Lantern characters. So this is one to be on the lookout for, for sure. And it's also important to know that the artist is Jamal Campbell, who is the artist on Naomi and saw, we know, the heat that that book saw. That's one thing I was putting the correlation to also is, I mean, I want to sit there and grasp at straws, but it is important to know that Jamal Campbell is doing the art on this, who also is doing the art on Naomi. And you've also seen people uh, referencing the logo on Naomi's costume and tying it to the Green Lantern universe somehow. Either way, you brought up a good point about how this book might be under order because it's on the Young Animal imprint. And then also with the think of a title of Far Sector, if they're not aware, they not might, they might not know it's a Green Lantern type tie-in so to say i mean it says dc young animals puts their spin on the legacy of green lanterns at the final of the solicit great book we're both green lantern fans so i'm in it for the reading ability alone and if it, it picks up speculation wise that's just an added bonus right and i tell you what brian a little kind of nugget of information for all of my history buffs out there one thing that i think that gives an idea of where this book is going to head, is I think that this Green Lantern character is going to be kind of an abolitionist for the people. Um, and I think that the name Sojourner, as her first name, is a clear reference to Sojourner Truth, who was a uh, women's rights activist. Um, I think that that is probably a kind of nod to her and kind of gives us an idea where this story is going to go. I think she's going to fight for the rights of the people who have had those kind of feelings stripped away from them. I think that's where this story is probably going to end up going. Kicking on over to Image Comics, we get Family Tree number one. This is from awesome, awesome author Jeff Lemire, as well as it's got just the one cover for it, and that's by Phil Hester. Right, and now this is going to be the first of two Jeff Lemire books that we're going to talk about today on The Last Call Show, the pre-FOC show, letting you know what books you need to make sure you get those orders in for right now. And this one, like you mentioned, comes from Image Comics, a little creator-owned action. And 
The solicit talks about when an eight-year-old girl literally begins to transform into a tree, her single mom, troubled brother, and possibly insane grandfather, embark on a bizarre and heart-wrenching odyssey across the back roads of America in a desperate search for a way to cure her horrifying transformation before it's too late. So, sounds a little fantastical, sounds a little Grootish. If you look at gonna- the co- the Sounds like a Groot it, origin story. It's Groot's sister. <laughs> right. If you look at the cover for issue two, uh, she starts to look like Groot. So I think that that is kind of uh, the feel with this. It's funny how these ideas kind of uh, spark up with you where it's like, you know, what if that happened? Um, but I think that this is an interesting story. Jeff Lemire has had a lot of his properties of late get Hollywood attention. Um, I like the fact that there's only one cover. It makes it a little easier to, to kind of make your pick and uh, solidifies – the book to go for. So this is one that's got my attention to be on the lookout for. Either way, I think it'll be a good read. Here we have another DC Black Label book in the Dollhouse Family number one. This is going to have a regular cover as well as a Jay Anacleto cardstock variant. Yeah, and we don't know yet what the popularity of these Joe Hill Hill House books is going to be. We talked about one last week. We're coming with another one this week. But I'm excited. We've talked about horrors hot. This book really sounds like a horror movie if I've ever heard it. Uh, A 19th century dollhouse family heirloom serves as an escape for a little girl named Alice. Literally. She can go inside and reality and the imaginary start to blend together. As she grows older, Alice realizes her dollhouse has taken control of her life. Uh, these covers look creepy. This story sounds interesting. This premise sounds like a movie. Um, we know that children and horror kind of go hand in hand. And uh, I think that this one has a good opportunity to have some success. The creative team is Mike Carey and Peter Gross. If you're not familiar with those two, they are a longtime creative duo who are, have worked on the Lucifer comic for a number of years for Vertigo and DC Comics. So there is some like continuity there with these two working together so i'm interested to check this book out right and if you look at looks like on the cover of cover a there's like a little logo there like exclusive first look in entertainment weekly so you might get some of that crossover appeal with this book as well horror enthusiasts definitely this one i think is more of a a reader book but either way i'm excited to get my hands on it and give it a look and hopefully it doesn't give me nightmares Sticking with horror, but moving over to Marvel, we have Morbius number one right now. This looks to have four covers. You have the regular cover. There's also a cover B, as well as a connecting variant, but there's also a 1 in 25 incentive Greg Land variant. Right, Morbius the living vampire. Or is he? That's what this solicit of this new ongoing series talks about. For years, Nobel Prize winning biologist Michael Morbius has been struggling to cure himself of vampirism. And now, for the first time in years, that result may be within his grasp, but it is littered with dangers and more. So we know in this series that he's going to be trying to get rid of that vampirism. We may see a change in kind of the Morbius character a little bit. But either way, we know why this series is coming to be, Brian, don't we? Yeah, everyone's hyped on that Jared Leto Morbius movie coming out. And I think Jared Leto's going to bring his A game. We've heard that he's kind of salty about the situation behind the Joker and um, the performance that Joaquin Phoenix laid for the Joker. I expect Jared Leto to bring his A game on Morbius. I do. I'm cautious of this book, though, because it seems like lately whenever a Morbius series comes out from Marvel, it may as well be a miniseries because it doesn't seem to last long. Correct, correct. Now, I think the fact that they're calling it an ongoing right off the bat is pretty good, but I've, they've done that in the past. Another thing I like is Ryan Brown covers. Ryan Brown is a major up-and-comer for Marvel, and um, while number one is nice, um, we've seen cover art for issue number two. It gets even better. I think that that will help pace this book. Um, I think that Ryan Brown is kind of like one of those next-up artists. Definitely agree. Brian Brown was doing a lot of store exclusives, and now he's starting to do a lot of main covers for the actual big two. (laughs) 
Moving back over to DC, we get the question, the deaths of Vic Sage number one. We talked about another Jeff Lemire book, and this is it. But not only that, but that cover A has a kick-ass cover by Bill Sienkiewicz. Absolutely. Now, the question is one of those cult classic fan uh, favorites who uh, maybe has never really peaked in the secondary market, but always seems to get a lot of um, kind of old school fan attention. And I love the fact that this book is being released under DC Black Label. That kind of gives you an idea of the kind of feel and the target audience for this book. And that gets me more excited than anything else. This is obviously, like we said, this is the second book of Jeff Lemire's that we're talking about here. Um, Vic Sage, you know, is a kind of uh, classic the version of the question. There's multiple characters who have been the question, um, but this is going to track kind of his experience through history. Um, it, and I think that this is one that is going to maybe get overlooked by people. We've seen that these black label books don't necessarily do immediate secondary market success, but have all registered as amazing reads. I think the fact that this is black label, the fact that this is going to be a classic Vic Sage and the question story, and the fact that Jeff Lemire is writing this, I think this is going to be a good book. And I think it's going to be a book that long term could have some 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 spec play with the fact that it's it's not going to be a heavily ordered book. Either way, like you mentioned, excellent Bill Sienkiewicz cover, excellent writer. It's a recipe for some serious reader buzz. Right. And as I mentioned before, I'm more of a fan of Jeff Lemire as the author. He does have a cover B variant for this book. And from Marvel, hitting it with that mutant family, we get Fallen Angels number one. This has a bunch of different covers from a bunch of great artists. We got Ashley Witter. We got Greg Land. We got Mark Bagley. There's Rob Liefeld. We all know some news that came out with Rob Liefeld and Marvel. But there's also a Gabrielle Del Otto and a Pepe Larraz variant. So, right, we've talked about this with these um, these X books, and, the, and they're kind of going to be the test of did this House of X powers of X thing work? In my opinion, we're seeing too many X books. There's just too many of these for them all to be able to sustain. Now, I will say the fact that this is an X23 driven book does bode well for it. We know X23 usually finds success on the secondary market. But let us know, Simpleman's Comics family, how do you feel about the amount of X books that are existing on the market? In my opinion, too many. Too many at once, especially. I think it's going to hurt all of them across the board. But maybe I'm being negative. We'll see. Let us know. Yeah, too many X chromosomes. Now, normally... We say there's no typical order for these picks. We just call them out as we see them kind of spread them apart so we're not going over back to back with the same publisher. But I can say without a doubt, this pick is my top pick for FOC this week. And we're talking about Folklords number one from Boom Studios, which you're aware of that already from that awesome graphic. <laughs> I mean, either way, great book. We had an advanced PDF copy. Can't say enough good things about it. We've talked about this book on other shows already a little bit, but it's going to have four different covers for it. You have that cover A. The cover B is fire, but there's also an FOC Dan Mora variant. But more importantly, there's an FOC 1 in 25 black and white Dan Mora variant. Yeah, now if you rewind back to when I, I was talking Something is Killing the Children on the uh, Bolo show, and I was bragging about the success of that book and how we told you guys early. I stopped and said, I got one more for you. Folklords, folklords, folklords. And that was way early in the game. And now is the time. Now is the time for you to make that decision whether you're in or out. Now, we know and have experienced the hype of these last two boom books that found serious success in the secondary market. We saw what happened. Will there be excess copies available of cover a yes and that is because this is part of that boom guarantee program meaning retailers can order these books and return them but the thing about that is unlike once in future 
we have some variants for this book, Brian. We have a cover B, which I think since this solicitation came out, it was the book to grab. Absolutely amazing. Most of the art on Folklords is very kind of um, cartoony almost. It's it's a kind of a Harry Potter type uh, story, kind of a almost like a quest book. Um, you called it Harry Potter meets the village, um, and which I no. think Dungeons and Dragons. Cartoon. Dungeons and Dragons. Yes, I'm not a Harry village. Potter guy. That's why I just said it to you. Like okay. That. <laughs> Boom calls it a Harry Potter type story. But yes, you did call it Dungeons and Dragons meets the village. And if you read the book, you'll understand the village reference. But I've read the book. I absolutely think it's stellar. I think it's a great book. I've said this before. I'm not a fantasy guy. I have never seen a Harry Potter movie. Uh, when this book was like presented to me, it wasn't something that I really thought – was going to be something I was going to get behind. Um, I honestly put off maybe paying attention to it for a while. And then Brian read it and was like, this book is awesome. And I read it and was like, holy crap, this book is awesome. That cover B got announced. And I said, man, that is a cover. Because honestly, I like Matt Smith. I didn't love that cover A from a speculation perspective. Um, I, I loved that cover B. But stop the presses because we're at the FOC show, right? They announced an FOC variant, that Dan Moore variant. That Dan Moore variant looks like everything we love about Once and Future in those covers. Um, Dan Moore is the Power Ranger artist, and now he's bringing that that game to these creator own books. I mentioned to Brian before we went on air. I love Matt Kim. I he was somebody that I connected with. People know that I like Valiant Comics. Um, he was the writer that I paid attention to first. What he does, his descriptive nature of writing really makes you kind of understand the world you're in right off the bat. I think that's what will make him successful with this book. Also, his other Boom Studios book, Grass Kings, just got announced for a television option today. We're filming this on Wednesday. So he's already got that hot Hollywood hand. I think Folklords is one of those books that could be that next big thing. That Dan Mora FOC variant is amazing, excellent, features all the characters, great color. I like the black background. But that's not all. They announced an FOC incentive variant, something you don't see from Boom with their creator-owned titles. A 1 in 25 black and white version of that Dan Mora variant. I think that thing could see heat. And it only incentivizes stores to order more. So when you guys get mad and say that the print runs got jacked up understand that those are factors that have a lot to do with why stores will order more but this book is delivering i think it's going to deliver on on expectations bleeding cool ran an article six days ago six days ago talking in their speculation corner about the fact that cover a was selling for eight dollars on ebay already that co that cover a and cover b together in a lot were selling for 15 that is way before FOC and kind of unheard of in the speculation market. This book has all the makings of an indie buzz book. I think you are going to hear about this book over the next month leading up to its release. I, I think, yes, you will be able to find cover A on, on release day. Will you be able to find cover B and cover C? I don't know. Will you be able to get your hands on that incentive without paying through the nose? Because you know that unless you have a great relationship with your LCS – that if that incentive takes off on the secondary market between now and release day, 23 days from FOC, that dealers aren't going to let that book go cheap. They're going to hit market value. But that's the beauty of this show. If you want that incentive, let your LCS know right now that you want it. Let them know. The beauty is they can spread their orders amongst three covers. So they have that ability to kind of hedge their bet. That is why I love this show. I love that we get to talk about these books. We want to let you guys know this is a book we believe in. This is a book we've read. This is a book we've had the opportunity to see this organic growth happening. And I say organic because it's not manufactured. There's nobody doing this. This is being talked about widespread. I have saw two posts just in the last few days from major comic retailers talking about reading the Folklore's PDF that Brian and I got an opportunity to look at and being like, wow, I have to talk about this. Black Cape Comics talked about it on Instagram. And Big Bang Comics talked about it on Twitter. Now, if you're not familiar with Big Bang Comics, it's a giant European retailer in Ireland who has a monster social media presence. 
So there is a ton of pre-FOC talk about this book, but I don't think it's going to matter. And I don't think you should let that sway you from getting in on this book now. So that is going to wrap up our 10 picks for this week. But as always, Jack is going to tell us what additional printings are coming out this FOC as well. So this week with the later printings, it's all about Marvel Comics. And it's a very short list. We start off with Amazing Spider-Man 31, the second print Ryan Otley variant. Then we've got House of X number one and Powers of X number one coming with fifth printing Mark Brooks variants. Staying with that X theme, we've got House of X number four, the third printing from Declan Shelby. And House of X number six with that Laraz variant, second printing. And finally, we've got Spider-Verse number one, the second printing variant. So there it is. Those are the later printings. And again, if you want to see the full FOC list, head over to simplemanscomics.com. We got the full FOC as far as comic books, trading cards, toys, everything that Diamond is offering is final at Final War Cutoff this coming Monday night at 10 p.m. Eastern. And again, let us know in the comments. Are any of these books something that you're interested in? Which one out of all of these are you most excited to order? Because we're always excited to see what you, the viewer, are interested in reading and picking up and ordering as well. And with that being said, I'm Brian Wood. And I'm Jack DeMeo, a.k.a. Mr. Bolo. Remember, buy what you like. That way you'll always be happy with your collection. And this has been Last Call.